Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the IMF's press briefing on the regional economic outlook for Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm Candia with the Communications Department, and I'm delighted to be here today with Nigel Chuck. He is the Acting Director of the Western Hemisphere Department of the IMF. Nigel will give some remarks, and he will answer to your questions afterwards. With that, Nigel, the floor Thank you. Is. Thank you, Maria. I just want to start by advertising that we have uh, just published our regional economic outlook for the Western Hemisphere region, and that more fully describes our views on the region. It also has some interesting analytical work that examines the impact of climate change in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also looks into how to make tax systems in the region more fair and more supportive of growth. Let me quickly offer some comments on the outlook for the region. The good news is that after taking a very heavy toll for much of 2021, the pandemic appeared receding in many parts of Latin America and the Caribbean. However, this is not a time for complacency. Vaccination campaigns have helped mitigate the pandemic's impact, but there are still important inequities in the availability of vaccines, and these need to be addressed. In this regard, I'd like to highlight the efforts by the US and by others to expand vaccine access in the region. Turning to the economic outlook, growth has actually been better than we had expected, and we've moved our forecast up accordingly. We now expect the region to grow by 6.3% in 2021 and by 3% in 2022. There's clearly a lot of uncertainty associated with the outlook, both related to the pandemic and to back, uh, variants, but also surrounding the speed and the timing of the return of private demand as policy support in the region is scaled back. Given these uncertainties, countries should prepare for this recovery not to be a linear path. As the title of our economic outlook suggests there is a long and winding road ahead with setbacks likely to be encountered along the way. I also want to say that there is important heterogeneity across the region. We should not forget, for instance, that many tourism dependent economies in the Caribbean continue to face a very challenging environment. And even in those countries that have bounced back quickly, the recovery in employment has been very uneven. The young, the less educated, and women are bearing a heavy toll, and there has been important damage to human capital during the pandemic, both from the unemployment, from increasing informality, and also from prolonged school closures. These trends will likely take many years to reverse. And finally, let me say a word on inflation, which has become an important feature for much of the region. Rising commodity and food prices, global increases in goods prices, Sector-specific constraints and supply chain disruptions are all pushing consumer prices higher. Many central banks in the region have rightly reacted to these pressures by raising policy rates to underscore their commitment to their inflation goals. It is likely that these interest rate increases will continue in many countries in the coming months, and if inflation expectations become less well anchored, makers may have to react even more assertively. Managing this delicate balance, especially at a time when the economy remains below its potential, tricky and inevitably puts an important premium on clear and transparent communications by these central banks. Now with these remarks, I turn to your questions. Maria. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, we're going to start with a question from Alfonso Fernandez from the Spanish uh, uh, EFE. Is Latin America entering a new lost decade? Latin America is projected to be the region with the highest inflation in the world. Could a sudden tightening in advanced economies lead to stagnation in growth? Thank, thanks for that question. So, 
as I said before, inflation is definitely a concern in the region. Um, but I would note that there's a very different institutional contact, context for the region than in previous inflationary cycles. I think there's been a huge investment in, in credibilities of central banks, and there's a big shift to inflation targeting regimes in a lot of countries, and I think this will really help in managing both inflation and in inflation expectations. However, as I said previously, if there is particularly a move in inflation expectations, I think central banks will have to react, and that will mean higher interest rates and of financial conditions. Um, on the, the, the stagnation question, I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case, but I think we are very conscious that the toll of the COVID crisis has been very heavy in Latin America. We've seen substantial increases in poverty across the region. I think the middle class are in an increasingly precarious situation. And I think we're seeing a lot of social strains across the region that are being against itself in, in demonstrations and also in, in uh, broader concerns. Um, we do actually see that it will be some time, perhaps not even in our five-year forecast horizon, for the region's GDP to return back to where the pre-crisis trend was. We are concerned that labor participation is much lower than it has been in the past and has been slow to recover, and also productivity is, is potentially lower. So I think all of these underline really important supply-side reforms that will be needed to be taken, both to raise participation, encourage particularly female and young um, workers to come back to the labor force, and also to improve productivity and increase private sector participation in the economy. So I don't think it's determined um, that, that the economies will do poorly, but I think it will take some policy efforts in order to reverse the damage done by COVID. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. We're going to uh, go to two online questions uh, from Mexico. Silvia Rodriguez from El Milenio and Yolanda Morales from El Economista. So Silvia is asking, what is the scenario for my country in the face of inflationary pressures and um, slowdown on growth? And uh, Yol Yolanda is asking, the increase in the exchange reserves provides more protection than the flexible credit line. And let me just add one more question. Uh, it's very similar, both of them asking about the um, reform in the electricity, electricity sector. Um, and, and so they're asking if this limits the private investment in the sector and what is the risk for the GDP outlook? Okay, Th thanks. There's a lot in there. Um, uh, let me let me talk uh, uh, first about the, the scenario for Mexico. I mean, we do see Mexico recovering quite fast from the pandemic from last year. Um, with growth over 6% this year, so that's, that's very good. I think you, Mexico is being buoyed by a very strong rebound in the U.S. Um, and you know, strong demand for, for goods, particularly in the U.S., where Mexico is, is exporting. Um, so that's, that's all helping. Um, we also see some scope for additional fiscal support to the economy, both this year and, and over the medium term, particularly to increase investments in social areas and health and education to try and reverse some of the damage I think was done by, by the pandemic. Um, certainly, inflation has increased in Mexico. Uh, some of that's imported from uh, inflation in the U.S. Um, some of it is more general trends on, on goods prices. And you know, the, the central bank has reacted. I think we see inflation expectations still very well anchored in in Mexico, and, and you know, it's right for the central bank to be raising rates. Um, on, on the FCL, so we we believe that the FCL has provided very important support for Mexico for several years. Um, and it's provided uh, benefits that we see in terms of uh, financial market costs of financing um, and access. Um, I think the FCL also demonstrates a very strong policy framework in Mexico. And we recently conducted the Article 4. I think the statement was published in, in early October. Um, and we should regard the FCL as part of a multi-layered approach in Mexico in common with you know, Fed swap lines, with uh, NAFTA swap lines as well, and also uh, reserves. Um, and I would note that the, the, these are all complementary. I don't think they're really substitutes. They're complementary approaches. And I would note that the, um, the fund also significantly added to Mexican reserves in the SDR allocation, which I think will help um, protect the economy from uh, external shocks. Oh, and oh, the question on the electricity sector, sorry. Um, so on the electricity sector, I think we engaged during the Article 4 to discuss the reforms. They're still being formed, so it's hard to come to a specific view on the reforms. I think more generally, we think it's very important in Mexico. We've seen relatively weak private investment for, for some years. And so we think it's very important that whatever the reforms do, that they do encourage um, a better business environment and encourage private investment particularly. I think they provide an opportunity for Mexico to increasingly rely on renewable sources. Um, and I think the goals of the, the 
the reforms we would totally agree with in terms of providing cheaper electricity, more reliable electricity, and also a greener electricity um, mix as well. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Nigel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bundle two questions from uh, Ecuador. So uh, Sebastian Angulo from Expresso and Will Mendes from Primicias. Sebastian is asking, the IMF estimates that the Ecuadorian economy will grow 3.5% in 2022. On what is this growth based, taking into account that the Ecuadorian government must make a significant adjustment next year within the framework of the extended fund facility program. And uh, Wilmer is asking a related question on growth, Ecuador's economic prospects maintain, taking into account that the government has not uh, been able to approve a tax and labor reform as planned and um, has not e uh, been able to completely eliminate the fuel subsidy. Okay, let me, on, on the growth, it's true that uh, Ecuador suffered a tremendous contraction last year. It was almost 8%. And um, there was a, a terrible impact of the pandemic in, in Ecuador with lives lost and really tragic outcomes. Um, but having said that, since the middle of last year, we have seen a very broad-based recovery in, in Ecuador. There are a number of forces that behind that. One is just the, the, the adapting to COVID and, and reducing caseloads of COVID has really helped. Um, and and this, we're starting to see some impact of vaccination. Um, but also, I think Ecuador is really being buoyed by um, high oil prices in terms of trade and quite strong growth in its trading partners. So all of these have really, really helped push the economy forward. And we do see quite a, a, a good recovery this year, um, largely based with, on, on private sector demand. Um, on the the Reforms, I think we think the reforms are very, very important that the government plans on the, on the tax side, labor, and, and on the fuel subsidies. Um, we've seen some progress, but I think there does need to be a broad societal debate on those reforms, um, including in, in the legislature. Um, our, we believe that the tax reform as it's designed will generate revenues that will be helpful in terms of meeting social needs. Um, and the, revenue, the way it generates revenues is, is both progressive and, and uh, equitable. Uh, and it will help more of a non-oil tax base that will insulate um, Ecuador to some extent from shifts in oil prices. Um, and, and similarly, in the, in the fuel subsidy program is to gradually phase that out during the course of the program um, and get back to cost recovery for fu fuel. But we're very confident that has to be done in a careful way, in a gradual way, and particularly with um, protections in place to support the poor during that transition. Thanks, Nigel. Um, we're going to go to some questions on WebEx. I think uh, Argentine reporters are in the room. I'm not seeing them. Can you hear me? Hi. Hello? Yes. Maria? Yes. Let's go to Rafael. Uh, Matus from La Nación. I'm hearing you, Rafael, and then we'll take questions on Argentina if, if we have some. Please go Thanks, ahead. Um, Nigel, it's good to see you again. I have a question on Argentina. Inflation is on the rise in Argentina, and Gita Gopinath said a few days ago that expectations are unanchored. Do you think that the, uh, currently that the government has the right policy mix to bring inflation down, and uh, is there a risk of an inflationary spiral? Thanks. Thanks, Rafael. Let me take, uh, Nigel, two more questions. Uh, Paula Lugones from Clarín. Here. Hi, I'm here. How are you? Um, well, uh, what's economic growth in Argentina expected to fall sharply from 7.5 this year to 2.5 in 2022? And also, uh, Minister Guzman was here in Washington last week. Was there any advance in the negotiation with the IMF? Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And, and Liliana Franco from Ambito, I understand she wanted to also ask a question. Liliana, are you there? Yes. Are you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I was reading the new framework of that substance the sustainability release this year. And the question is, the IMF will incorporate the quasi-fiscal debt on the, of the central bank in the new agreement with Argentina? Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. I thank you. Okay, so uh, th thanks. On Rafael's question. So 
so certainly inflation is an important issue in, in Argentina. Um, I think we see it as a multifaceted uh, drivers of that inflation. And um, we do think that, that expectations have become unanchored. We see, though, that responding to that inflation will take uh, actions on a number of fronts, given the, the different drivers of inflation. On the macroeconomic side, we also see that potentially there's a role for other policies, including incomes policies, to address that inflation. Um, on, on the growth question, so we do have growth uh, rebounding quite sharply this year, um, but then tailing off into next year. I think that's common in many forecasts for other countries also uh, in and it's really sort of, it's much easier when the economy is operating well below potential that the economy can rebound quite quickly at the start and as it gets closer to potential and uh, there are more constraints, you start seeing more supply, supply side constraints, which I think we see in a number of places in the region. Um, and on the negotiations, we continue to have an active and, and, and cordial dialogue with the Argentines. We're working together on, on various different topics uh, towards the um, and so we, Minister Guzman was here during the annual meetings and met with the managing director, met with the team, and there's also been a lot of technical discussions uh, among the team and IMF staff. Um, and then the, the question on debt sustainability and, and the incorporation of, of quasi debt and central bank debt, I think that's a somewhat technical question. I think these are one of the, one of the issues that is being worked through uh, during these discussions uh, with you. So I don't want to preempt those discussions, um, but it's certainly something that we're looking at. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. I'm going to go to a line question from Michael Stott uh, from the Financial Times. Uh, it is a regional question. He's saying, um, as the U.S. and Europe tighten monetary policy, how big are the risks to Latin America's economies from a tightening of credit conditions? So I think it would be right for the region to prepare, um, in, you know, looking forward, that there will be a withdrawal of monetary support in some of the large advances particularly in the United States, which is very important for them. I think we're already seeing um, the U.S. Federal Reserve flagging that it will start soon tapering its asset purchases and um, potentially raising rates. Our forecasts assume rates will start rising towards the end of next year. Um, we think it's going to be a very gradual process. I think w what we believe is that it's very important that that process is very well telegraphed and advanced and is well communicated, which I think the Federal Reserve has been doing. Nonetheless, as those financial conditions tighten, we will see potentially lower capital flows into the region. We potentially will see higher costs of capital for the region. And I think you know, that will provide some headwind to growth. At the same time, we should expect that the, that period where rates are rising in the US is because the US economy is doing very well. And so for many countries, I think those with strong trade leaks to the US, like Mexico and Canada, you're actually going to see a net positive effect that while interest rates will be rising and financial conditions may tighten, the effects from very strong U.S. growth will overwhelm those. Thanks, Nigel. I think that uh, Eric Martin is also on WebEx and wanted to come in. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Very good. Uh, thank Eric. you, Nigel, for taking the time. I have a few questions for you. Uh, one is following on the, uh, the questions of my colleagues from Argentina about whether the IMF is planning any kind of a visit to uh, staff visit to Buenos Aires uh, for the remainder of this year. Um, another is on El Salvador in the Article 4 uh, about wh whether that will be published in November, as the country uh, is saying, uh, and when will the EFF program begin. Um, thirdly, uh, does the IMF believe that Bitcoin poses only upside risks for El Salvador, as the central chief in El Salvador says? And finally, a uh, question about Bloomberg's reporting um, from, uh, from earlier this month on the uh, Article 4 of Brazil earlier this year. Uh, we understand that uh, Managing Director Cristalina Gorgias um, intervened uh, or took part in the process after being contacted by the Executive Director of Brazil um, and asked to uh, delete some lines of text from that Article 4. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how the executive director of knew those particular lines would be uh, would be included, and whether that was, uh, you know, something from the draft report that was either uh, in print or read to the ED, and whether uh, your team generally has faced that kind of pressure from uh, from EDs uh, from the board, particularly regarding climate change and the uh, the macro critical uh, nature or macro critical analysis of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So on a staff visit to Buenos Aires, as I said, the, the Argentine 
had actually been in Washington um, during the annual meetings and we had good meetings with them um, at, at various different levels of staff and, and management. I don't think there's any reason why the, the team would not go to Buenos Aires, but I think we're just going to play it as, as it comes to see whether that's necessary and, and if it's useful for the negotiations and discussions, then I'm sure the team will, will go. On El Salvador, yes, the Article 4 is underway or it will soon be underway. Um, the exact timeline will be likely towards the end of the year. The, um, the board will consider that Article 4. And I should say also that we are having continued discussions with the authorities on, on a range of issues linked to, to a potential program. Um, but that, that, that's, that's sort of ongoing. Um, in terms of the, the Bitcoin question, um, I think we do see important um, issues related to Bitcoin being a, a national currency and legal tender. Um, those range from financial stability questions a bunch of fiscal questions uh, associated with that adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender. We're also um, conscious of potential uh, risks to um, AML CFT regimes that we're looking at. So we are actively engaged with the, the El Salvadorian government and help them think through some of these risks and downsides and to, to address them. So that's ongoing work as well. And I'm sure there'll be a few also in the Article 4. And then the question on, on um, the Brazil, I, I would say that the you know, managing director has already spoken to this um, quite extensively. I think she, she's described that there's a normal process with st between staff and management consulting on every Article 4 consultation. And I would say that, that just on the, your specific question, that not only the draft report for the draft staff report for Brazil was not shared with the Brazilians, but I can say that as a, as a policy matter, the fund, does not, fund staff do not share draft reports until they're issued to the board. Thank you, Nigel. We're going to go to Benjamin uh, from, apologies, from Diario Financiero on Wavex. He wants to ask a question as well. Hi, hi. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so um, it's a question about pension withdrawals in Chile, the event of a possible short round of withdrawals. Do you think that Chilean central bank will have enough available tools to protect financial stability? What could be the worst consequences of such development? If, as it was done in previous withdrawals, do you think it can be mitigated by legislation in some way? Okay, thank you, Benjamin. So on the Benjamin withdrawals in Chile, I think we were supportive uh, last year in the midst of the pandemic as there were certainly important hardships for the Chilean people, that this was a, a mechanism by which uh, fairly quickly liquidity support could be provided um, by allowing for withdrawals from um, people's pension accounts. And so I think we were supportive of that as an emergency measure. I think getting into a, a time where those emergency measures in many countries have expired and, and you know, those extraordinary efforts that were made during the pandemic are no longer necessary and, and indeed there's more time to think through more structural um, approaches to, to addressing these these questions. Primary concern on the pension withdrawal question is that it does leave retirees potentially without sufficient pension for when they retire then there's a real question with that then how, how you deal with that would the government have to step in and in order to provide uh, support for those retirees or um, some other mechanism will have to be designed in order to encourage a sort of replenishment of those pension resources. So I think we're, we're, we don't see so much as a financiability question, but more as sort of this longer term intergenerational question of how um, retirees are going to ensure that they can be, um, you know, have a reading standards in, in retirement and, and without having to rely on the state and more relying on their, their own pension funds. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. We're, we're going to go to um, some of questions. One of them is on Panama. Uh, Jimenez is asking from um, La Prensa, what are your latest forecasts uh, for the Panamanian economy in 2021 and 2022? And what will be the main factors that will determine the future of the economy? And what could be the impact on the economy, the fact that the country continues on lists such as the Financial Action Task Force, for, I'm sorry, um, the OECD, European Union? Great. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, Roberto. So our forecast of growth in Panama is, is the economy is coming roaring back. I think it's going to be one of the fastest growing economies this year in, in the region. Um, but having said that, it really had a very sharp decline last year. And so really is, is a bounce back uh, from those very low levels last year that were quite extraordinary. Um, what's driving it? I think there's a, in, as 
The rest of the region is similar forces. Um, I think we're seeing COVID vaccination rates and declining case numbers is helping. Um, a rebound in demand for in-person services is also helping. Um, there's some idiosyncratic things like the a new subway lines being built um, and the construction is on, on that, which is boosting uh, the economy. There's uh, copper mining is, is growing quite fast. Um, and then generally the, we've seen a, a strong resurgence in global trade as, as large economies, particularly US and Europe, have shifted towards a lot more goods consumption and less services consumption, which benefits um, Panama because of the canal activity as uh, they're, they're greatly helped by, by global trade. On your question on um, the tax information sharing, the OECD question and the AML CFT from the, uh, the FATF, you know, we think it's very important that these issues are addressed. Um, you know, the, the AML CFT regime needs to be strengthened. There's important shortfalls there that have been identified by the FATF. Um, but we're confident that the authorities are very committed to addressing those, those issues. We have a PLL with Panama where a core part of the PLL is, is to deal with some of those um, AML CFT issues. Um, and we've also have an open dialogue and we're providing capacity development as well to help Panama with those. Um, and I think there's a very similar issue on, on tax and sharing where we're, you know, we're working through our fiscal affairs department and trying to help the authorities to address those questions. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we have a question from uh, Jeremias Bustillo uh, from La Tribuna in Honduras. He has a couple of questions um, related to the economic outlook in 2022 with a new government and emerging from the pandemic. Uh, what will be the reports for the economic growth projections? What reforms are needed to underpin uh, the inclusive economy? And he has one more question on the impacts of CETES project uh, through which autonomous territories are delimited where they will not pay tax uh, to the Okay. So, so on the outlook, the outlook's improving. We have a, a program with Honduras and we have a very active engagement with the country. Again, very similar forces that I discussed earlier. COVID um, uh, recovery and, and reducing case rates is, is helping. I think very strong support from external uh, sources, particularly remittance flows to Honduras that is really helping uh, the economy. And, and we're seeing pick up in vaccination rates, which is also we, we expect going into 2022 to be a strong force to allow demand to rebound. Um, on longer term questions, I think we see very important uh, longer term needs in, in things like public investment and infrastructure. We think there's an important need to further expand the safety net, um, including in areas like health and education. I, I discussed at the beginning a little bit about the damage that's been caused by COVID. Kids have had to drop out of school and, and they've lost education times. And I think also we see a lot of uh, areas on, on climate adaptation and resilience are, are very important given, given some of the weather forces that have affected Central America. Um, on, on the ZEDIS question and, and more generally on, on Assumptions. I think the government is trying to address and make some headway on, on delimiting those exemptions. And um, there was a decree in June which uh, made efforts in that direction. We're very supportive of that. Um, I think I would highlight also one important area on these exemptions is the overall governance and transparency um, around them. I think particularly reporting on the cost of the exemptions is important because they are an expenditure of government resources. And so um, making people aware of how much these costs the government and what the trade-offs are with potentially with other spending areas like public investment and safety net spending that I described earlier. Thanks, Nigel. <clears throat> Let us um, end with uh, two questions on, on the Caribbean uh, from Sean Cumberbatch, the nation of uh, Barbados. He's asking what should Barbados and the Caribbean's main priorities be now as they seek economic recovery from COVID-19? And he has a specific question about uh, Barbados. He's asking inflation pressures are growing on countries. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, what should Barbados and uh, other countries do? I, I already read it as a uh, seek economic recovery from COVID-19. I'm sorry. OK, thanks. So um, I think we, you know, we have seen particularly the tourism dependent economies in the Caribbean really got hammered very hard. Uh, COVID and, and I think they're continuing to face significant decline in the number of tourism uh, resources that are coming into the country, which uh, is a, a huge external shock that's really affecting the whole region. Um, in Barbados, we have um, a very good relationship. The program is going very well. Um, the government has been very committed to implementing all of the policies under the program and, and it's, it's progressing well. And I think we saw even during this difficult situation, um, you know, the, the program and, and assistance and 
of support from the fund really helped um, to some extent mitigate the, the damage that was done by COVID in, the, in Barbados. Um, I think in general across I think the priority has to be investing in public health, expanding vaccinations and, and getting access to vaccinations. I discussed a bit at the beginning, the access to vaccinations is important for the region. Um, and also it'll be very key in the coming months just to see how tourism will develop through the, the winter months and, and how the economy comes out of this winter, um, the extent that the tourism does bounce back. And we are seeing some encouraging early signs on that, that tourism is, in, is improving quite strongly. Um, I would say, though, that the, the pandemic left the region with much higher debt than it had before and a very difficult social situation. And I think now we're seeing inflation, particularly food inflation, adding to that, uh, those social strains. Um, that's very incident on, on the poor. Um, and I think there, you know, the fiscal support is limited, but I think there are options domestically to provide additional um, support for the poor in some countries. Um, and, and potentially, you know, the fund has provided significant resources through the SDR allocation to the region and stands ready if they, the, the countries need assistance, either for capacity development reason or financial assistance, the fund is, is standing ready. And, and, and indeed, we're thinking very much about the resilience and sustainability trust that I think would be very well suited to the Caribbean um, to help provide longer term financing and support them. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, with this, uh, we conclude the press conference. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, and uh, stay safe. Thanks. Thank you.